So it's uh, fun to be here. I've uh, really enjoyed the conference so far. When I was thinking about coming here from Washington a couple of days ago, I was really uh, motivated to forward my slide. Um, there we go. I was motivated to come because uh, in the 27 days before I came here, 23 of those days it had rained. And so this is interesting uh, data that I found um, showing the frequency of cloud cover at uh, 12 p.m. every day. And you can see the blue bar in the middle uh, showing something really significant and awful has happened in Washington this spring. Of course, it's been sunny in Washington the entire time I've been here. So I want to talk about creating data and sharing data at a really massive scale. And what we're trying to do at the NIH right now with the creation of the PMI cohort program is really inspired and enabled by all of the work that all of you do. Uh, it's been uh, great to hear your work. So what we're going to try to do is build a cohort of a million or more volunteers. Uh, the cohort will not be statistically representative of the U.S. population, but we hope that it will uh, reflect the diversity and richness of our uh, culture and population. It will be a longitudinal cohort, uh, much like the uh, U.K. Biobank with ongoing ability to interact with our cohort participants. There will be two methods of uh, recruitment, one through healthcare provider organizations, which is rather familiar, the other through uh, enabling anybody anywhere to raise their hand and say, I want to participate. Um, I think I mentioned when I was here last year that during the State of the Union, when the president announced the Precision Medicine Initiative, my mom, who has uh, rheumatoid arthritis and is severely crippled, typed with her stylus on her iPad, where do I sign up? So she's sort of front of mind for me, and uh, I want to be able to make sure that she and other people like her, who may not be in great circumstances, can get out and uh, participate in this program. Uh, it's uh, important for us to keep our expectations um, in perspective. So when we launch this program, which will likely be this fall in terms of open enrollment, um, it's going to take us several years to get to a million participants. And so it's important to keep that in mind. It's not going to be like we'll have a million people enrolled and have all their data and biospecimens by the time we uh, have this meeting again next year. And central to this entire effort is that the data be readily available and uh, for sharing. So uh, the kinds of scientific questions that this cohort is intended to enable um, uh, people to probe are listed here. I won't walk through them. They're very similar, in fact, to the kinds of questions that the UK Biobank is already enabling. And we have been greatly benefited by having Rory Collins, uh, uh, Dr. Landry's uh, colleague, on our working group that helped plan this effort and have really been working closely with them and also with the Million Veterans Program to learn what we can from uh, other similar uh, large-scale efforts. So the president, as uh, Bill Riley mentioned and as Claudia Williams mentioned yesterday, has been really, really, really involved in this program. And he uh, is unbelievably well informed about it. Uh, we have uh, regular meetings with him and with the cabinet members who are involved, uh, keeping them updated and uh, making sure that they are happy with our progress. So we're having to move really at lightning speed. Uh, this is a quote from uh, the president in February uh, at a PMI summit that we had at the White House that was just really stunning. I know Claudia mentioned a few of those talks. So at the heart of the PMI cohort is that participation will be open to everybody, that it will reflect the rich diversity of the United States, that the, partner, the participants will be our partners in every stage. So we want to have participants in all of the advisory groups, the planning groups, the IRB. When we take on scientific projects, when we plan what research will be done in the cohort, it has to do two things. It has to be kick-ass science, and it has to build the relationship that we have with the participants. It has to be stuff that the participants uh, will view as beneficial and will um, build and not erode their trust in this program. And that's going to be particularly important in the very early days. Um, we are going to provide access to the study information for the participants, including their own individual information. And of course, that's going to have to be factored in as well in terms of what kinds of research we do in what order, because it's not just about providing access to the research community, but also providing access to those partners and participants. 
We want to make the data easily and uh, broadly accessible uh, for research purposes, um, while at the same time making sure that we do what we can to protect the privacy and security of that information. And of course, that's an ongoing issue and an issue that when we invite people to enroll, we're going to have to be clear with them that we're we'll have to explain to them what we're going to do to protect the information, but also be real realistic that there's no 100% guarantee of privacy and safety. And then one of the things that's been most fun for me uh, about being involved as one of the uh, architects here is using PMI as a catalyst for making changes in other programs. So examples would include the partners, uh, participants as partners and engaging people all along the way, um, really changing policies about returning research results back to the human uh, participants who are involved, um, changing the pace at which we solicit and review and make awards of uh, new great ideas. We've been moving at an amazing pace, frankly, uh, with PMI, and I'll give you some examples of that. So the core data that we hope to collect will include patient participant-provided information, so that will be very similar to and informed by the kinds of information that the UK Biobank has uh, gotten from their participants. Most of this will be done on people's phones, um, but we will also have other means for people to provide information, like old-fashioned phones. Um, EMR data, uh, which will be really straightforward to get from healthcare provider organizations who are our partners, more difficult to get from people who are signing up as direct volunteers. I'll talk more about that. Um, we have to get a baseline health exam. Again, how are we going to do that for people who are not um, uh, enrolling through their health care provider who's going to do those health exams? How are we going to make sure that they're standardized and rigorous? Um, we need to collect a biospecimen. We want to build in a data streaming from mobile and wearable devices, geospatial and environmental sensor data. And like the UK Biobank, we're going to start with a core set of high value data. And then as time goes by and we gain more experience, that data set will grow and evolve and expand. So um, this program is going to be the largest longitudinal cohort in the United States. Um, we are getting it started at lightning speed. Um, we are integrating partners at every step of the way, which uh, is challenging and uh, really invigorating. And um, this program is under uh, close scrutiny. So uh, when the president is interested in something, it's really important that you not screw it up. <laughs> so um, I want to talk a little bit about where we are in terms of starting to put the pieces together that are essential to building this research cohort. So we want to have the direct volunteers, the people in blue, providing all this information, and the healthcare provider organization volunteers, the HPO volunteers, providing all this information, baseline exam, biospecimens, and that uh, information then being generated uh, into a coordinating center, and that that coordinating center would, in very uh, quick order, make that data available back to the participants and uh, back for research purposes. And of course, over time, that database will get bigger and bigger. So where are we and what do we need to do in order to put this project together? The first thing we need to do is we need to learn how to do this at scale, especially for direct volunteer recruitment. So we uh, awarded in February a uh, interesting collaboration between Verily and Vanderbilt to do a pilot project, and they are really helping us understand how do we engage individuals sort of one by one uh, in order to get them involved, uh, consented, and providing participant provided information um, for the cohort study. And that's underway <clears throat> and a very fun collaboration. The second pilot project that we're doing is um, equally uh, exciting. It is a pilot that we're doing with federally qualified health centers. And the goal there is that we want to make sure that we have a representation of people who have traditionally been underrepresented in biomedical research. And that's a, a high priority for us. We have not done at NIH a ton of research in collaboration with federally qualified health centers. We've done some, not a ton. Um, and so we're looking forward to being able to have uh, a network of federally qualified health centers 
uh, where 60% of the patients that are seen in federally qualified center, health centers are uh, under the federal poverty line, um, overrepresented and underrepresented groups, um, some of the um, most vulnerable people in the country. So we want to have those folks have an opportunity to participate as well and really be able to use the cohort to tackle some of the questions that we have so far really not been very successfully attacking in health disparities. So we are now uh, inviting those uh, community health centers to work with us to start to model how this can work, and that's underway. Um, we are putting out a policy that's going to require, NIH is putting out a broad policy that's going to require that every multi-site clinical trial use a single IRB, and that policy is going to be coming out in about a week. Um, and we're uh, showing how cool that is by having a national IRB for um, for the PMI, and that um, IRB is chaired by Nancy Cass from Johns Hopkins. It is an amazing group of people. They have met multiple times now and are really the guardians and stewards uh, for this program for, uh, for the nation. Uh, we need a smart, funny, uh, passionate leader, and we now have uh, that person in place. Um, that's uh, Eric Dishman, who uh, accepted the job last month and will start uh, next month on June 13th. He comes to us from Intel. He's a social science researcher by training, um, is a cancer survivor, and uh, uh, I love him deeply, and I can't wait till he comes, and he loves me too. Um, we're also looking for a chief technology officer, and that's not a position that we tend to recruit for at NIH. Oops. Oh, I got this thing in my head. Um, so we, are, we just posted this week um, uh, a posting for a senior uh, chief technology officer who will report directly to Eric and will be responsible for partnering with all of these moving parts that are part of the cohort to make sure that the technology works. And so that search committee has been put together. Leslie Curtis, who's somewhere in the room, is on the search committee. And so if you're interested in this job, uh, connect up with Leslie. Uh, the position closes on the uh, 24th of this month. The next thing that we need to do is we need to have a biobank. If we're going to collect biospecimens from a million or more Americans, we need to have a place to put them. And so that's really a rate limiting step for us in getting going. So we, we uh, fast forwarded that solicitation and review and award, and we actually awarded this morning um, the first uh, big PMI award, $142 million, $142 million uh, over five years to Mayo Clinic to create our biobank. And they're going to have a capacity of 33 million specimens. And we spent a lot of time debating about this, and we're saying that it is the will be the world's largest research cohort biobank. I dare you to challenge me on that. Um, and, and importantly, and I think, I think Martin really made this point clear this morning in his talk, too often we say, oh, let's build a biobank, we'll collect a bunch of sa samples, and then you ask the people who run the biobank, have you given them to anybody? And it's not an archive, it's not a dusty place where you have a bunch of little tubes, right? You want to make sure that it's actively used. So we will do have some analysis that happens within the PMI cohort core program, but we also want to make the specimens available for research, and, and the UK uh, Biobank is sort of modeling that for us. So. Uh, so that's now in place. The other big pieces for the PMI pro, uh, cohort program include the Coordinating Center, uh, Participant Technology Center, which is really about wearables and uh, mobile technologies, and then these uh, five to seven healthcare provider organizations that will partner with us. Those are our big, important pieces that we will be putting in place, and all of those have now been reviewed, and uh, we are now going to uh, be making uh, deliberations and then making those awards later this month and into early next month. So we'll have all those pieces in place uh, by midsummer. So highly talented uh, coordinating center, the healthcare providers, the participant technology. The other thing that we need before we launch is that we need people across the country, uh, especially um, leaders in communities, to know that this is coming. So when we do a national launch, we don't want people to be surprised. We don't want people to be grumpy. So we're going to have to do, between now and the fall, a really thorough job of talking to people across the country and letting them know this is happening. And there's two key groups that I would like to 
uh, make sure that we touch. One is healthcare provider organizations so that they understand that we're not going to be giving back massive amounts of clinically actionable information that then patients are going to be running into their office and saying, you know, deal with this. Um, and that's certainly not going to be happening in the first wave. Uh, so we want to make sure that healthcare providers are comfortable with where we are and hopefully partners and advocates. And the second thing is that we need to make sure that leaders in communities, religious leaders, civic leaders, other thought leaders in counties and um, towns across America are familiar with this so that when we do do the launch and people go to their church and say, what do you think about this? Should we participate? That people are already aware and engaged. So where do we want to be in December? We want to have all the infrastructure, and, I'll, and December should be uh, obvious why we're picking December is the time where we want to have some metrics um, met. Um, we want to have all the infrastructure in place. We want to have the cohort, cohort program launched. We want my mom signed up. We want 78,999 other individuals signed up because we told the president we'd get 79,000, and I got one. So. <laughs> Um, we want to have a handful of interesting research projects underway. And it, it, this is where I would love to hear from all of you of what could we do with, and we're only going to have, it's going to be incomplete information from different part, for direct volunteers, we're going to have participant provided information from the HPO volunteers, we'll have more co comprehensive pieces of this core uh, data. What kinds of questions could we ask that would be interesting? And maybe in comparison to MVP data, UK, UK Biobank data, what could we ask even early on that would be uh, useful and interesting? Um, we're keeping our fingers crossed that nothing bad happens along the way. Um, and then we need to put some policies in place to make sure that this all works. And I'm going to spend a couple minutes talking about some of the policy issues here. Um, and this, of course, is what's going to happen in December and uh, January um, is uh, I'm going to turn into a frog. And, uh, and so I really want to see this um, off and running before that. So I wanted to transition to the policy issues by sharing this quote from this guy, Jer Thorpe, who's a data artist, and this is his data art down below. And he says, data live utilitarian lives from the moment they are conceived as measurements of something or some system or person. They are conscripted to a cause of being useful. They are fed into algorithms, clustered and merged, mapped and reduced. Always, though, the measure of life of data is its utility. Data that are collected but not used are condemned to a quiet life in a database. So we want to make sure that our data do not dwell in obscurity and want to make sure that they are out there in the world. And the policy framework for um, allowing that and the policy framework for encouraging that really is not completely in place. And so we're working uh, on that. So while we want to make sure we are sharing data wide widely, we also want to make sure that people um, people's data is protected uh, and that there's good security. And these are some of the um, measures that are in place now or are being strengthened that can protect participants' data. I'm not going to talk so much about the, the privacy stuff right now, but there's already moves to strengthen, for example, certificates of confidentiality so that if you're doing research that's funded by us, you will automatically get a certificate that involves humans. You will automatically get a certificate of confidentiality, and that allows you to say, no, I will not disclose even if somebody tries to compel disclosure, such as with subpoena or through law enforcement. So that's an extra measure of uh, protection for people who are uh, altruistically donating their data. So in terms of um, being able to allow people to share data about themselves, that right now is a pretty difficult thing to do. So thinking about medical records, um, there is the myth of a blue button that you can push and your, your health uh, information magically appears on your phone or on your computer. Um, we need to be able to uh, allow people to get their electronic health information for their own purposes, for purposes of taking care of their family, but we also need to enable them to provide it to whoever they want, whether it's their loved one, whether, or not, whether it's a new physician, or whether it's a research program. And so we are working um, 
really hard to put all the pieces together to enable that, both from a technological standpoint, from a funding standpoint, and also from a policy standpoint. And one of the key pieces of this has been put in place by our colleagues in HHS and Office of Civil Rights, which are the um, folks who take care of HIPAA, and most people like, you know, get the heebie-jeebies when you say HIPAA, but HIPAA has done some fantastic things, and the people in OCR have done even more fantastic things recently in terms of right of access to your own medical information. So back in January-ish, they put out a new policy that really reinforced the right of an individual to have access to their own medical records. So when I moved my mom from Texas to uh, Minneapolis, I ended up having to cajole and um, and other things, many, many, many healthcare providers in order for them to give me uh, crappy paper records. Um, this new right basically says that I have the right to my health information, that I can tell uh, the holder of my health information how I want it provide it to me. So in the past, you might have called your doctor and say, oh, just email that to me. And they would say, oh, I'm sorry, that's not secure. I can't do that. Now they have to do that. So, um, and that it has to be provided within a reasonable period of time and that there can't be exorbitant fees um, and you can direct them to send it to somebody else. So these are all really important policy advances in order to allow us to let people um, sink for science. Um, the other thing that, that the president has really been the lead on in this whole effort has been about participants getting their own information back. And I think last year I shared that the president has said to us that you know we were the, the people who are playing this program or we're all very wise and very thoughtful, and so we may know some reason why people shouldn't get their information back. But if we uncover that example or strong case, we need to come back and talk to them about that. We have not yet set up that meeting, and I'm hoping we don't have to. I'm, ho I'm hoping that we'll be able to figure out how to give every individual all of their data back. So in the PMI uh, summit in February, uh, the president said, I'd like to think that if somebody does a test on me or on my gene, that's mine. So similarly, uh, with the HIPAA right of access, um, there have been some really important steps forward that I think are interesting to know about. One is that this HIPAA right of access means that if a clinical laboratory does genomic analysis on you and then provides back a limited set of those analyses, um, that you can request and get the complete set of genomic analyses that were performed um, on you. And this has become particularly relevant um, rec recently when a set of patients um, ask for their data on BRCA1, BRCA2, et cetera, from Myriad, and Myriad said, no, thank you. And they uh, evoked their HIPAA right of access, um, ultimately successfully, in order to get that data. So again, uh, data about me should be mine, uh, sort of a theme here. So in order to technologically make that possible, we have been working on trying to get information to flow smoothly from EMR providers uh, to individuals and be directed into PMI. And so we have, um, have a little pilot. I should have mentioned this in the earlier pilots. We have this little pilot uh, th through the Office of the National Coordinator and with uh, Harvard University working on uh, what we call Sync for Science. And this, oops, I'm going to go back. And uh, here's a little uh, video clip of the president talking about Sync for Science. Hi, everyone. This is President Barack Obama. The Precision we didn't know that. The <laughs> initiative I launched last year aims to help doctors tailor treatments for patients based on their unique genes, environments, and lifestyles. To see this effort through, we need better data. That's why we're pioneering a new approach called Sync for Science. Here's the idea. With the click of a button, you'll be able to voluntarily share your health data to help our scientists perform groundbreaking research. It's another way we can all help open up the possibilities of the future. So if anybody can identify what was, the, what was wrong in that video, I'll give you some sort of prize, or I'll have Rob Caleb give you some sort of prize. There's one scientific error in that video. Um, so Sync for Science is going to make possible, develop these methods to facilitate the movement of this information from EMR providers uh, into the cohort program, 
presumably that will have much wider applications for other research programs as well. Um, and we really want to create this ecosystem uh, for individuals to mediate the flow of their information uh, in, a, in, the, uh, in and around uh, research. So um, this program is ongoing. We look forward to them doing some interesting and exciting things. Some of the uh, collaborators are listed down there at the bottom, including uh, most of the leading EMR providers. So recently, um, in the last State of the Union, you heard the president um, announce another science initiative. He announced the Cancer Moonshot. So if you've been keeping track, this would be the third scientific initiative in three successive State of the Unions by this president. The first was the Brain Initiative, the second was Precision Medicine, and the third is the Cancer Moonshot. And there's an interesting intersection and coordination between the Cancer Moonshot and the Precision Medicine Initiative. I'm thrilled to be involved uh, deeply in both. Um, what's really been um, um, invigorating is the passion that Joe Biden brings to freeing data. And he is passionate, committed, will do anything um, to make sure that data is not hoarded. Uh, he talks a lot about breaking down data silos. My colleague at uh, the Agency for International Development calls them silos of excellence, cylinders of excellence. Um, and so he's really providing a, a moving force for putting in place policies that will um, reward data sharing, reward um, uh, using that shared data, and really uh, uh, holding up a big stick over the heads of people who are hoarding their data. So with that, I am going to thank you very much for your attention and uh, look forward to questions. Well, thank you, Kathy. That was uh, a wonderful announcement. Love to hear it. I understand that uh, people back home on the East Coast are already tweeting about this. That's so right. excited to hear about that. Um, at this point, we'd like to take some questions from the group. Yes, go ahead. Hi, uh, it's a great, inspiring talk, and I'm very excited about PMI. Uh, so one question that you didn't touch upon that much is the longitudinal aspect. So in my mind, the longitudinal cohorts that is really most valuable if you have a long-term follow-up of yep. individuals. And while that's easy in UK or other European countries, it's much more challenging here in the US, people moving around between health systems, et cetera. So what, what are the plans there? So in the healthcare provider organizations where We've asked people to tell us about the nature of their patient populations and what percentage of their patient population is really sticky and stays with them over a long period of time. That will be important for the longitudinal part. But we're going to have to build in mechanisms for people to be able to move out of a healthcare provider organization and become you know, a tr transition into a direct volunteer status uh, within the cohort. So we're, we haven't built those pathways yet, but we know that we have to. I think they'll be pretty straightforward. Um, and then with direct volunteers who are living in you know, Kansas City and then move to Manhattan, um, we're hoping that that will be a pretty easy transition to make because the individual is the controller. Nothing else has to move with them. Um, but we are mindful of that. And like the UK Biobank, we're hoping that this goes on for decades and decades. Um, and uh, in terms of the, fo the ongoing collection of information, one of the things that we're testing in the pilot it will be testing in the pilot, direct volunteer pilot, is what, what are people's preferences about how often they share how much information and how much can we tie that to people's individual preferences. So I might want to answer a bunch, a module of questions at 2 o'clock in the morning, but other people might not want to do that. So, so we're, we're doing some experiments around that, and certainly a lot of the talks that have been uh, presented here really feed into that kind of uh, knowledge. Thank you. Yes. Hi, thanks so much for your talk. Uh, my name is Stephanie Cross, and I'm a pediatric endocrinologist here at Stanford. And I would love to hear you talk about if you're planning to collect additional disease-specific information on certain subpopulations. So for example, I take care of kids with type 1 diabetes. Currently, our patients are generating a huge amount of data, um, especially those wearing continuous glucose monitors. They literally have measurements every five minutes. And we are thinking about how we can best use that information clinically, but also analyze it as researchers. And I'm curious, um, for other populations, adults with hypertension, et cetera, if you'll be collecting more data of certain types on different populations. Yeah, so let me, let me see if I can address your question in three 
three parts. First, we will be including kids. So we'll be including people from all ages and life stages in the cohort. Um, when we launch, we will probably not be prepared for kids through the direct volunteers program, especially because the nature of the health exam and how you collect the specimen will be not yet figured out, but we are planning on that and we've been spending a lot of time with, with that. Um, we will enable secondary research with the cohort. So if you wanted to recruit people through the cohort for a sub-study on type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes or any, any specific disease, you could do that. And then the third thing, which is a sort of an embryonic idea right now, but one that um, Eric is very excited about, Eric Dishman is very excited about, is he would like to work with the different institutes and centers and patient groups to think about how we could come up with um, what kinds of data would we want and analyses of biospecimens would we want to have for specific disease areas and then maybe do sort of releases of PMI that are focused on specific disease um, diseases. So we're just starting to think through that. The initial um, data set is going to be rather limited as we're getting our sea legs, um, but really do hope to expand, um, expand rapidly um, over time. Thank you. Next question there. Uh, Kathy, my name is Vince. You articulate presentation so well. So I'm going to answer your question on that prize money. Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. So I'm going to attempt this because it was a short uh, video. So I think the animation, the graphic animation was going from patient to doctor, but it was not going from doctor back to the... <laughs> <laughs> At least tried. <laughs> Somebody, actually, somebody, somebody should be able to answer this question, yeah. Anybody, <laughs> any takers for a question? <laughs> yes, back in the back there, we'll get you the uh, microphone. Thank you. Now, are you going to tell us the answer? I will tell point? you the okay. answer. Yeah, Is there a prize? We get if I answer 140? it, there's no prize. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, go ahead. Um, so I was, I was very interested in 23andMe's model of uh, sending emails mm. to the participants yeah. yep. where, where they can dynamically ask people uh, about their behaviors and try and, as they have ideas, um, uh, collect new information and yeah. uh, you know, build up more models. So do you have the, the plan to do that kind of thing? And yeah. you know, would you be accepting ideas from researchers and, and that kind of thing as you go. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I particularly love the, um, are you a morning person, are you a night person, and the period genes showing up and with no definition of what more, you know, I love that. So we're gonna be doing, we're gonna be doing a lot of participant provided information across the, across the board about lifestyle, about mood, about social interactions, about diet, the whole gamut, as well as having the health exam, the EMR data, the biospecimen. That's going to be the initial set of stuff. So the participant provided information, the sort of the questions you can answer on your phone, um, are going to be the deepest data set that we will have initially, just because it will be the easiest to get. Okay, another question here, and then maybe we might want to take a couple from over in the side. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Can you talk a little bit more about the privacy and security aspects and kind of how the fact that you can never guarantee it affects what you might want to do? I was also specifically interested in the law enforcement subpoena point yeah. you made. Thank you. So, um, so there are two sets of principles that have been developed by the White House, one a set of privacy principles, the other a set of security principles, and they are um, and, the, and the security principles were just finalized, I think, yesterday. So they're on the White House website. You can Google Google for them. Um, we have a number of laws that apply to the privacy and security of information that we um, will be implementing. 
So for all of the awards, all of the grants that are submitted to us will have to go through a security check from our CIO. And then there'll be um, all sorts of penetration testing that will take place. Um, and depending on where this data lives, um, there's a real question about whether or not you bring the researcher to the data or if you let the data go to the researcher. And those have very different sort of security uh, considerations. So if you bring the researcher to the data, you can actually watch what the researcher is doing with the data. And that has an important security uh, component to it. Um, in order for all of the parts of our um, cohort program to work, all of them will need um, uh, authorization to operate, which can only be afforded after lots of security measures have been, uh, boxes have been checked. So, so um, in terms of law enforcement, these certificates of confidentiality are in federal law. They've been there for a very long time. They were initially put in place for um, studies of criminal behavior and studies of mental illness. And so that information, people wanted to allow that research to go forward without people being fearful that it would fall into the hands of the police, et cetera. There's been some really interesting, we've now expanded that. Most genetic studies require or encourage people to have certificates of confidentiality. There's been some interesting studies that have been done on how have they held, how have they fared. So have people showed up at universities' doorsteps and, and uh, researchers' uh, labs and asked for data and have the researchers held up their certificate of confidentiality and said, no, you can't have this? And the answer is yes, and it has worked. Um, the Congress last year in our appropriation bill where we got $2 billion up from last year, yay, um, said that they want us to give out certificates of confidentiality for all human subjects research. And uh, we're in the process of implementing that. And so you'll start to see as a routine course in um, if you check the box that says you're using human subjects, it will likely pretty automatically trigger that you will just get a certificate of confidentiality. The one bad thing about a certificate is that it's voluntary. So it gives you, the researcher, the right to say to the, law, to the guy with the badge at your door to go away. But if you want to, you can disclose to him. And, and I think we need to sort of stitch that up a little bit. It's a little bit of a, uh, a hole there. But I think we've got, um, we've got good measures in place, but um, as you all know from the, you know, my data is all in China, my data, my husband's data, everybody in my family's data is now living in China because of the OPM breach. And so um, there's always a risk. Yep. So we have time, we're over, but we, I'll let you give Is a it the answer to question. the question? I, I have the answer. Is it, is it the DNA helix angle? It's, Hand, it's the handedness of the DNA. Yay! <laughs> and you had the microphone. Hi, Kathy. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for this great information. Uh, Daniel Markowitz, uh, Hematology Oncology. Americans with disabilities, are they eligible uh, for participation or not? So, yes, we want to make sure that people with disabilities are able to participate, including my mom. Um, and that's going to require really special stuff from the direct volunteer angle in terms of, so do we have people who are doing the health exams and collecting the biospecimens going to people's homes, right? That's what you really need. And that's going to increase the cost. And it's also going to make sure that we are as inclusive as we really need to be. So we're going to, we've seen some amazing, uh, ideas for how to make that happen in the applications that we're getting to review right now and uh, look forward to making those awards. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Kathy, for all of this wonderful information. I think there's a lot of exciting new news today. And thank you all. At this point, I'd like to welcome um, my colleague Dennis Wall to the stage to introduce the next session on digital health and technology.